Okay, I am going to take you on a, a whirlwind tour of, uh, of advanced cover cropping. And, and this is going to be detailed. It's going to be some of the forward thinking. Uh, it's going to be some hard hitting details here. So uh, fasten your seat belts. And I'll just give a really brief introduction here. I've been uh, planting green since 1984. And yeah, we didn't have the equipment we have today. We've come a long way. Uh, in the mid-90s then, I uh, was able to get a uh, roller to roll crimp cover crops, and I still use that today. I use it primarily for my pumpkins and squash that I grow, but also I, I will usually leave a few fields later on in my corn and soybeans as, as well. And uh, some of you probably know that uh, I was uh, responsible with Dr. Ray Weil in helping to develop the tillage radish. This is the first plot to be planted in 2001. I'm glad I took that picture because it literally has, has uh, been known around the world. And um, so but based on, on that and the cover cropping, my goal on my farm is to keep the soil covered with living roots year round, all around. We've been hearing that multiple times here. But I'm really going to zone in on a couple topics here today. One of them is one of the toughest ways to plant green is by planting corn into a green grass cover crop. Uh, so I'm going to spend most of my time in there. I'm not really going to talk much about soybeans. They're fairly straightforward, fairly easy in the context here. And I am going to mention also the, the, uh, why you should use legumes if possible. But uh, when we are, have the uh, only option is to plant like a cereal rye, uh, this is some of the mistakes that people make, and one of them is where you need to avoid the potential to lodge. And as Trey said, when you are planting across six foot tall rye that's rolled down, there is no, probably no planter out there that can actually cut through that. And I'm going to show you a device that may come close, but uh, that's one area that you have to be very, very intentional about. And part of that is your seeding rate. It starts uh, on uh, what your seeding rate is in the fall. I'm suggesting keep it low. If we're talking cereal rye here, it's 30 pounds to the acre during the month of September. When October comes, 60 pounds to the acre, bump it up a little bit. And then know your fertility levels. Because uh, if you have higher fertility, if you're putting manure on or you overlap manure, that can go down and lodge on you. This is more of a concern when, a, when it gets taller. And, and when it you know, gets the higher C to N ratio in it. So a little bit of uh, some management techniques begin at planting. And then you also have to plant around weather events. If you have fairly tall cover crop that is fairly thick and there's a front coming through, they're calling for wind and heavy rains, you know, that can blow it down every which way. And I took this picture to illustrate this point. There's a storm rolling in and I am rolling as fast as I can. Because in this case here, it was a hairy vetch and rye mix, and hairy vetch crawls up. Hairy vetch will actually almost help pull it down. So this is, a, this is what I call a pro tip, if you will, uh, to, to try and roll ahead of uh, a rainy event. And this is why I roll when it's time to roll, and I plant when it's time to plant. And so if you are planting and rolling at the same time, be sure to keep your cover crops lower seeding rates so they don't lodge. Now you're going to have to determine what that is in your farm. I, I, I gave you some numbers there, but you have to determine what that is because it's based on fertility and planting date in the fall. So a lot of these little things have to add up. Uh, one, I remember one Sunday evening, the, the, I listened to the, I looked at the weather report and I looked at the radar and I saw pretty heavy storms coming through and I had uh, quite a bit of hairy vetch and triticale out there. So I started at 11 p.m. and rolled till the thunder and lightning were all around me at 2 a.m. as fast as I could. because and, and it was starting to rain the last bit and it was starting to go down some. So this is the type of a management technique you need to do. It's particularly worse, I'll say, when you mix a cover crop like a, especially hairy vetch, because it climbs up that rye or triticale and it'll literally pull it down. Uh, this is the cover crop slicer that Peckway Planter makes. It's a local Amish uh, shop that they make a lot of no-till tools for the Amish and smaller people, smaller growers, I should say. Uh, but these are this is a tool they made. I have heard it works fairly well. I've never tested it myself, but this is what potentially could be capable of planting through heavy cover. 
The idea behind this is you have a straight blade and you have two gauge wheels on either side of it to essentially hold the cover in place to give it a better cutting action. So there may be some tools out there that can help with this. The second thing in uh, no, or, uh, planting green into cereal rye of corn is not enough nitrogen in or very close to the row. I'm going to blow through this because Trey covered it well. He's exactly right. There is zero nitrogen available when you're planting into a tall rye. Doesn't mean there's none there. It's zero available for your corn plant to grow. Now that may be a little exaggeration, but you hear my point. There's, there's nothing there and you need to supply some nitrogen. Now if you mix some legumes with it, you can account for some of that. So um, having some sort of nitrogen in the furrow is almost a, I say, a requirement here. Uh, and then in addition to very close to the seed. Uh, broadcasting uh, works as well, but if it doesn't rain for three weeks and doesn't get that in, it's not going to do you much good. Uh, I, have, I mentioned here too understanding allelopathy. I'm going to touch on that a little bit here as I wrap this portion up. Uh, we can talk about that, but just key key thing here is assume there's no nitrogen in the soil. You got to get something there very quickly at planting in order for your corn plant not to struggle. Another thing is the seed tends not to be deep enough, and part of that is farmers do not compensate for the thick residue and adjust the depth control, the depth gauge wheels on their planter. You have to get out there and look and dig. And what I have found is when you're into these heavy covers, the I'll call it the root thatch or the root mass is so heavy, it's hard to even find seeds sometimes. So I take a trowel, a small garden trowel with me in the tractor and actually dig alongside the row and then you can just pull the roots out and you can get this beautiful uh, you know, you, you can really find where the seeds and how deep it's gone. You don't want to have hair pinning like you see here. So not only do you need to accommodate for the, the, the biomass of the cover crop, you also need to get deep enough and have your colders or your double disc openers, which I'm going to talk about next here, deep enough so that you have a good clean cut. You got to get the seed to soil contact. It, you have to do that or you're going to struggle with a poor stand. So getting that seed deep enough, with the, with the strength we have in our hybrid seeds now, um, they've come a long way in, in early growth for corn. And, and I've been planting my corn deeper. And, and, part of, and I'm getting better stands because it's more consistent uh, in, in that. So um, just, just planting it deep enough, two, two and a half inches. Again, you're going to have to adjust the local conditions. You, but you need to adjust to what is going on in that field. You have to get off the planter and really see uh, where it is. Another thing that some are going to is uh, eliminating the no-till coulter. And there's more and more farmers doing this, particularly with the advent of air or hydraulic downforce. Now it's much stronger than springs. We can, we can instead of the coulter, has historically been used to open up the slot for the double disc openers. But our planters are heavy duty enough now that we can use those double disc openers. And if you have a colder that has waves or bubbles in it, it can start messing with the seed trench at the end. And you might not have as, as good of a, of a seed stand. So if you have air hydraulic downforce, you can take those colders off. And uh, when you do that, though, you want to think about getting the heavier 3.5 millimeter disc blades just a little bit heavier because you're making them do more work now. And, and um, so that's very important kind of a consideration here in going this route. As far as your row cleaner height, if it's later in the season, which it typically is with taller cover crops, um, and it's starting to get warm, the soil temperature's starting to warm up, you might not need row cleaners. You might have them just to smooth things out so your gauge wheels do a good job. Or if it's on the cold side yet and you got to run, you can push it, put them down. I have uh, the, uh, the adjustable with air, I have the precision planting air clean, uh, row cleaners. They're beautiful to have. It's a nice, to me, it's no longer a luxury. It's a must. I want to be able to adjust them for whatever conditions that, that I have. So um, don't be afraid to, um, uh, like here's my uh, down pressure monitor for my planter. Don't be afraid to put the down pressure on. You won't screw it up and create more compaction when you're planting green. And I'm just backing up what Trey said, um, that what your, your soil is more stable. Make sure you get the pressure there to get through all this. 
So if you're doing this without colders, make sure you check your seed tube protector because those double discs are now going to have a lot more pressure on because they are opening up the seed slot and that seed tube protector will probably wear out quicker. But if you put the 3.5 millimeter blades on, that's going to help. But this is something that you need to check. And, uh, you know, beginning of the season or maybe halfway through just to see how it is wearing because there's more pressure on there because the blades are, are kind of pushing in against that. And uh, here's just an example. I just threw the, uh, by the end rows that I had rolled and two trays point. I just want to re-emphasize if you can roll later, that is a better option because if you roll before, you got to be really, really careful because here I was trying to be careful, but sometimes you plant your end rows and you're not exactly sure where they're going to end up. And uh, this was just like four or five feet, but that's, I stopped, took a picture. This is my planter set at full down pressure. It was hardly even cutting across that. So uh, it's a uh, just reminder here, maybe this slicer will do, will, will help with that. I think it would be better. Um, but anyway, it's just something that you need to be aware of. And the other thing is the struggle to close the seed trench. This is one of the probably bigger challenges in planting green, particularly into a cereal rye, because we have that lovely root mass that we like, but it's hard to close. And I say it's simply a technological issue. It's, it's not that you can't do it. We just got to get the right equipment. So there's all different kinds of closing wheels out there on the market. Um, this is the one I use. It's called Pro Stitch. I like the way it, uh, it was able to kind of push down through and it's an easier way to close the slot. I know you can hardly see that, so I put some arrows in there, but you want that seed slot closed. Now here is where I think the future needs to go. Uh, this is uh, monosim planters that are made in France. I, saw the, I just saw this in France when I was there in September. The little knob there on the left actually adjusts the toe in of the closing wheels. In other words, you can adjust it and it goes in and out like this. That is a necessity for planting. That, that just fact that you can do that would solve a lot of our issues. I think you could maybe use even rubber wheels and do a decent job closing the seed trance if you could adjust the toe in. But you go to another field that's a different situation, it'll make a ridge maybe back there that you don't want. But the ability to have a, a quick tet, quick adjustment on there is huge. Now the the setting on the right is, is your, uh, you know, uh, spring control and stuff for the, for the down pressure. So this is something that I would like to see come on more planters. I think it would solve this issue in that. Another problem with uh, spoked closing wheels is they tend to wrap, especially when the cover crop gets taller than about two feet. And that has been a problem. I've heard that come up numerous times. Uh, there are several aftermarket uh, deflectors on the market. This is from Yetter. I think it's the best one I've seen, the best one I've used, and I've used several of them. If you're serious into planting into long stem, dry, and so forth, this will uh, pretty much solve the problem. It takes some technique to get it adjusted just right because you, you have to, if you leave an eighth of an inch gap, it'll still, it'll still start clogging up. And if you have it too hard against the closing wheel, it's going to stop it from turning. So you can see it's close enough. I'm just barely scraping. And that takes a little effort to get that lined up for that, but it's something you can do. The fifth thing here is termination timing. Um, and this is really the first thing you do is you know what the weather has done and what's coming up. If it's April the 20th and it's, or, or I'll just use it, if it's two weeks before planting or around planting and it's really getting dry and there's no rain in sight, you better go out and kill your cover crop because uh, unless you have backup irrigation because it's difficult to make up for that and if you plant and it doesn't rain for two or three weeks and that corn doesn't come because the the growing crop is taking the moisture out of the ground that's a compromise I feel you're going to need to make or just spray a certain proportion of your fields uh, but on the other hand if it's wet use that cover crop to soak the moisture out of the ground and then you can kill it later on, maybe even after the crop is up, depending on uh, what your herbicide program is and so forth. So according to what the weather has been and what it will be can determine the timing of termination of, of doing this. So um, even uh, with or without crimping, you can spray two days before or you can spray afterwards. I've been amazed how well of a kill we've gotten even though we've passed through 
and with the planter knocking everything down, you're like, that spray doesn't get to the bottom part of, uh, it doesn't hit all the stuff that was rolled down, but somehow it seems to do a, a pretty good job. Um, so before, before corn emerges, or if you have Roundup Ready corn or traded corn, you can wait a little bit longer if you want to. The only reason to wait, in my opinion, is to let your cover crop grow longer, and that's if you have adequate moisture. But if you're getting on the edge of moisture, I think it's time to terminate at this point. Um, we all have different reasons and different uh, uh, reasons for planting green. This is a farmer from uh, Pennsylvania. Tip, uh, he has lower, lower fields that tend to be wet. He wants to grow his rye to dry out the fields. And this is with the Dawn Biologic uh, row cleaners on. Um, and it does a beautiful job. Puts it down nice and then it comes back in and also uh, sprays it. Um, also, uh, Brian Zimmerman's in the back of the room back here. And if you want to talk to him, they have that on their planter. This is their planter. Uh, and they, you can ask him about how that works. Just a real close up here if you haven't seen it. They have some, uh, some uh, discs up there to part the cover crop and then their rollers, they're right on the planter. I just wanted to show you this. This is, this is my planter here planting at night. And the reason I showed you this is when it is possible to get comfortable enough with this kind of a setup that yes, you can plant at night and, uh, and you can just keep on going. And uh, I appreciate your comment about the rain because we've done that, we can usually plant into about a quarter inch of rain, uh, which is a benefit sometime uh, to be able to keep it on. It's one of those benefits of being able to do that. But I'm telling you, if you're planting at night, uh, make sure the door to your cab is closed when you go out. Because if you leave it open and the lights are on, you come back, your cab will be full of about 1,000 bugs. Uh, and uh, that's a pain, believe me. Uh, the grid up. So I just took that picture to illustrate that to you. So my goal here is to grow, uh, when I'm doing this in corn, is to grow a nice uh, crop of corn and uh, have that residue still on the surface at the end uh, or when that, by the time it actually is harvested. A little bit on allelopathy, because this comes up, especially with cereal rye. I think a lot of allelopathy is misdiagnosed. Um, I think that uh, as I've looked into it and so forth, there is uh, certain reasons. I think a lot of the times it's just because there wasn't enough nitrogen there. Could also be for uh, cooler soils. Sometimes that's the reason. But as, uh, as, as I said, that's why we want to have nitrogen on the seed uh, as, 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 as soon as possible. So obviously you know that you have to put a nitrogen on the seed that is not going to hurt the seed. And there's a limitation to that. And then get it as close to the seed as you can as well. Uh, I've actually had success with putting on some 28%, one gallon, one gallon of 28% mixed with uh, two gallons of biological stimulant and micros and another gallon of water to get four gallons on, haven't had any issues. It's just to basically spark that corn off so that it, that it can grow. So I just want to reemphasize, I think that's one of the most important things that we understand to, to make this work, planting green, is that you have some nitrogen in or near the seed. Now I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about annual ryegrass control because that has been a challenge. Uh, annual ryegrass, you need to have a plan in place before you seed it. You need to have a plan in place how to control it. It is tough to control partly because of the things we like about it. It has deep roots, has uh, less biomass on top that we have to worry about, that's nice, but it has a waxy leaf. Sometimes some of the seed companies don't have pure seed and there's a couple different maturities in there and a lower, longer maturity and a slower maturity can, can change the different heights in the spring and you don't kill the one that's underneath the canopy. That equals the challenge to control. So if you're interested in annual dress, you have to start to get a comfort level, know the proper stage of growth, and again, as I said before, uh, adjust to whatever the soil moisture conditions are when you kill it and you need to make spray water. And when I'm talking about making spray water, I'm gonna explain that a little bit. As far as timing goes, the most effective time to kill on your ryegrass in its growth stage is at the first node. When you can go and you can look and you can see that little node just coming out of the sheath like of the leaf. That is the, uh, the most susceptible time for annual ryegrass to be killed. Now that doesn't always work out to when we want to kill it, but I'm just saying it's something to know. 
So some of the rules for using glyphosate, I'll just say it's not like spraying Roundup Ready beans in June. Uh, a lot of that has to do with temperature. So we need to make spray water first. And just some simple things here, adjust the pH 2, 4, 5 or so. And if you can work with the hardness, uh, get your water tested so you know what, it, know what it should be to down to less than three grains per gallon. Use some sort of a, a treatment to be able to get your water to this thing, this, uh, this ideal condition. The other thing that is hard to do, but you want to uh, ideally, if you can spray during the middle part of the day, is uh, I know it can't happen all the time, but it's going to increase your odds of success. Uh, I mean, how many times does all that stuff line up? Not a lot, but you do as much as you can. That's the point. And be ready to go. If you're listening to the weather forecast and it sounds good for the next day, you want to be ready to roll to do as much as you can then. So keep your rates on the, uh, on the higher side. Keep your gallons per acre down to 8 to 12 is what I've uh, come to know as a, kind of a sweet spot for most effectiveness. If you mix with residuals, you might get less control, and that's how I'm going to word that here. So for ideal, you, you don't mix with residuals. You come back with them later. Uh, and then you scout your fields and have a plan B in, in um, kind of in the bag, so to speak, if, if for whatever reason things didn't work out. Um, one suggestion, this is actually what I do, is I will, I will if I have annual ryegrass, is I will spray it whenever that time is, and then I'll plant corn, and then I'll come back with residual uh, and add a pint of gramoxone in just to like fry it off. And uh, that may be just a feel-good policy because... Uh, you know, when it's 10 days after you spray Roundup and there's still a lot of green out there, it's, it's a little disconcerting sometimes. Yes, you can use select clethodim post. Um, uh, that can be effective. Glyphosate will just, like, mow it. <laughs> It'll come right back. Uh, it just doesn't take it out to the root. So, again, as I mentioned, again, this whole factor of what's the moisture like, that's a critical thing to be successful in this. Kill it earlier if it's getting dry, leave it grow if it's, if it's staying wet. So you want to kill it dead. I think that's, a, that's, a, that's my simple point here uh, with that. Now, what about using legumes? Well, if you can lose legumes and planting green, the topic here is planting green, this is the ideal. But we can't get legumes planted all the time in the fall. We just don't have time. Um, so crimson clover, Again, I just want to make mention of crimson clover into corn. Glyphosate alone is sort of weak on it, and adding a little 2,4-D is uh, recommended to be able to get a good kill. And pretty much the same thing for hairy vetch. Uh, glyphosate is weak on hairy vetch, but 2,4-D will smoke it. You don't need much uh, to take it out. One of the things that you find out that you don't hear about at the meetings when you go home is... Uh, you start planting in this and you have stuff start catching on your planter, especially if you have something like hairy vetch. I mean, that's so viney and so succulent, it just like rips right off. And one of the things I had to do to my planter here, just put ropes across here. Uh, now this is a 15 inch planter, so when I'm planting corn, I'm just using the back 30s, but it was catching on some stuff in here. But, you know, it was a, it was a simple fix. I put ropes on there just to lay the cover crop down. This was right before it was like rollable, okay? So it wasn't down before I planted it. So I just illustrate, you will, you will run into things that you never thought of or someone never told you, but that just goes with it. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, say is ro using row cleaners that are non-wrapping, because this has been a barrier and some of the original more spoked spike row cleaners that were straight would tend to wrap. And there's nothing more frustrating than be all excited to go in and plant and you go one round and everything's wrapped up. Um, this is Yetter Shark Tooth with treader wheels. Uh, I feel that that helps. So if you're using road cleaners for whatever reason in this, these have found, I found to be doing uh, really good. And as I alluded to earlier, make your road cleaner adjustments as needed. So if it's a little cool, you might want to put them down to open up the seed slot a little bit uh, for whatever reason. If it's warming up, the, the next couple, couple days look really good. You can keep them the whole way up if you're getting the seed in the ground. So that, again, is a field by field basis. You as the operator need to make that decision how you use these tools here. So as I said, I'm still using my roller. Um, this has gone into uh, six foot tall cereal rye, a little hairy vetch in it. And um, just, just wanted to also show you 
uh, how we do it. This is actually here for pumpkins in this particular picture here. We're rolling down hairy vetch and uh, cereal rye. Uh, but one of the problems that we run into is at pollination, my John Deere changes into a cat tractor. Uh, and uh, this, this can be a problem with uh, radiators clogging, air intakes clogging. Uh, you got to watch the temperature. <laughs> Serious. My, my original tractor had a higher guy running it, and uh, he called me up and said, I think something's the matter with the tractor. And I, so I went over, and he could hear it gurgling. It was that hot. And I, was, I thought I blew the engine. He didn't, the lights were flashing and everything, and he didn't stop. Fortunately, we, we, it was okay, but it's just a word of warning here. So uh, some of the newer models, it, it's not that hard. There's screens that you can take out, and, and, uh, and, and if you really are seriously into this, if you're actually rolling during pollination, there's reversible fans you can get. Uh, that's not cheap. Uh, it's cheaper to roll in the morning when there's dew on it, okay? A little practicality here. Uh, or, or when it's light rain. If you happen to catch that, it doesn't happen all the time, but it's like, hey, I'm going to roll a day because, you know, light rain and I'm not going to worry about this pollen. Another simpler fix might be to plant triticale. Triticale does not pollinate as much as cereal rye. So if you're gone for that later time, um, this will not cause the problem as much. Okay, Neonix was brought up here before, and I'll just say that I have been doing some studies on this for the last three years on my farm. And um, as it was described here, the problem with some seed treatments is the slug eats the corn that was treated and then the carabid beetle comes and eats the slug and our, our friendly carabid beetles die and then the slugs just have a feast. So the theory behind that is let's try to protect our carabid beetle and not use a seed treatment. Um, here's one in action, happens to be eating a worm there, but I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I love to see biological warfare, uh, and this is what we want in our fields. But at what point can you do this? Um, and, and I'll just say, it is really weird pouring in yellow seed corn into the corn planter. That is weird. Uh, it just doesn't seem right. <laughs> but, uh, but here it is, there are some seed companies offering it now. And um, my recommendation, my recommendation is don't try this unless you're a couple years into cover crops and no-till. I'm just saying, theoretically, you probably need the seed treatments for a corn, boy, corn soybean rotation that's been that way forever. And there's been no cover crops and you don't have the biological life starting to come. You probably don't have some of the critters there that you need. So you need, so, and I don't have any data to back this up. This is just my advice. And start small. I've done it three years now. We've had no ill effects. That, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. I'm still open to that. But more and more farmers are looking into this. Um, and these are the guys who are kind of down the road a little bit in, in using cover crops and crop rotation and, and so forth. So that's just, uh, we can, if you have some more questions about that, we can talk about that. Now, how is, you know, planting green has been kind of drawing a lot of attention here lately, and I was in Bulgaria in April, and I was, they're just starting cover crops. Well, there was one enterprising farmer we visited, and he just had done a couple days before planted into this cover crop mix here. And I was really surprised I saw that. But what was really cool and what was exciting is showing him some of the differences. We actually uh, dug uh, in that field there, and we clearly just, this is just the second year of cover crops. We saw more earthworms in that field already. But I said, here, look at these lady beetles. And he's like, oh, wow, he got all excited. See, he didn't even know what to look for. Um, and we just know that's good, right? We just know that that is good. So. The whole planting green thing is, is, is out there. It's, um, it is certainly not without its challenges. And do not plant the whole farm first year in doing that, please. Um, start working with it and start learning yourself how to do it. And if you can talk to your neighbors who are trying it and see what they're doing. Just want to mention that we can get a, some other benefits is we can get weed control. And here's a situation that's later in the year, the end of May and uh, planting corn actually in here, 
I don't want to see that that field's planted. It was actually May the 29th, and you can't see because I have row cleaners are completely up. But that seed's in the ground two, two and a half inches, and a couple weeks later, beautiful green field. Nitrogen's going right on there with the planter, and I came back and side dressed again. This is not an instance where you're going to save a lot of nitrogen. Now, when you get 20 years into it, yeah, you can start saving some nitrogen here. You're going to save nitrogen when you use, uh, when you use uh, legumes with it and so forth. So we uh, chop that field off, corn silage, uh, 15 inch corn by the way, and plant precision planted here, crimson clover, radish and oats, and then came back the following year, and this is how it looks there with a nice crimson clover, going in there, and again, we're planting green. This field had 80 pounds of nitrogen, $5 worth of burned down herbicides and no residuals, except, gotta be honest, the bottom side of the field and the one headland. Saw some weeds coming, so. Uh, actually, post-emergence, sorry. Uh, but, but there's no residual, so I had to do a little post. 27 tons of silage came off there. Um, no testing, I'm just saying. Um, I was pretty happy. And uh, here's, here's all that cornfield look before we harvested it. So that pretty much wraps up my talk here. But the thing, as I say in almost all my talks, is in order to make any of this work, all these little things we talk about, all these details, if you treat your cover crops like your cash crops, you will stand a better chance of success.